We acknowledge the land we stand on is the territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and, and the Wendat peoples, peoples, and is now and home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Real world, an oasis, a pipeline, a community. Amplifying authentic voices, redefining Canada. It's your time. Come together, grow together. Have a voice. Be the voice. 20 years advocating, mentoring, supporting. Be the change you want. Hello everyone and welcome to today's event. My name is Dasla and I'm so pleased to have everyone joining us today. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce our two guests today. First we have Alex Bailey, who is a Métis producer and director from Toronto. She graduated from Concordia University in 2017 and through the National Screen Institute's Indigidocs program, she produced Emitososet, uh, Many Bloodlines, which went on to be selected as the Toronto International Film Festival Top 10 in 2020, and the film won Canada's Best Short Documentary at Hot Docs in 2020. Alex is currently working on a documentary short that will be released in early 2022. Um, yeah, we're welcome. We're pleased to have Alex join us today. And uh, next we have Alicia K. Harris, who is a filmmaker from Scarborough, Ontario. Her short film pick won Best Live Action Short at the 2020 Canadian Screen Awards and the Best Short Film at the Miami Film Festival. In 2021, she was the recipient of the Trailblazer Award at the Real World Film Festival. Collectively, her films have been broadcast nationally on CBC, TVO, Bell 5 TV, and at numerous festivals, including the, TIFF Next, including the Calgary International Film Festival and the TIFF Next Way Film Festival. Recent credits include NBC Universal's series Take Note and the Pressure music video for Grammy award-winning artist Coffee. Alicia is dedicated to celebrating the celebrating Black experience in her work with the focus on beauty, spirituality, and vulnerability. So welcome to Alicia. Uh, thank you both again for joining us and um, I hope the conversation is great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so excited, especially with the mission of Real World and everything that the festival has been fighting for for so long. It's really nice to be here. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll just leave you to it then. Thank you again. Okay, so maybe Alicia, I'll start by asking you a few questions if that's good. Yeah, sure. Okay. So what I love your film. I've seen it so many times. Um, oh. One of the things that's so striking about it is your sound design. And, you know, starting mm. at the beginning of your film, it's like so intense and then you move forward and it's more quiet. I was just curious to like your process with your sound and how you made those decisions. And then also in your editing with, ed, um, you know, was that made before or was that during your edit that that came out? Wow. I love this question because I usually never get asked things about the style. <laughs> it's always about the content, which, of course, is very important. Um, but it's really nice to talk to another filmmaker because the sound design is 
Um, yeah, it's really specific. Um, I when I first conceived uh, just the style in general, I knew that I the mission that I wanted to have was that I wanted to make the audience feel uncomfortable. Um, so for anyone who hasn't seen the film, it's about this girl that wears her Afro to school on picture day. And she basically has to deal with everybody's microaggressions and negative comments. And in the end, she has to decide if she wants to wear her Afro for her photo. And so I wanted the audience to be forced to feel how she feels because being in that position many times, um, where someone says something that makes you feel really uncomfortable, I just wanted the audience to feel that way. And I find people feel really uncomfortable in long silences. So the film doesn't have any music and I wanted to have diegetic sounds um, be used to kind of create anxiety and tension. Like there's certain parts where, you know, for example, she's in a classroom and somebody's playing mash or there's like a pencil tapping and then there's a clock ticking and there's kids laughing and there's all these sounds that we kind of layered and repeated in a really rhythmic way to show that, you know, she was very heightened to her surroundings. Um, and then there's one scene in the movie where there's a montage of everyone getting their photos taken and there's the really intense sound of a flash and like other kids smiling and her like debating in line and, you know, the photographer talking and counting down and it's all kind of, again, rhythmically building up and becoming more intense over time. And I basically just wanted everybody to feel the anxiety of the character. Um, so the sound is used very selectively and when it is there, it's very repetitive and it's building. And then when it's not there, it's just like making you sit and like process and watch how, you know, this character is feeling. So, I mean, definitely from the beginning, I thought I don't want there to be music and we tried it and I was like, I was right, <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, but I have to give props to my sound designer, Amanda Ann Min Wong, because she was just an amazing collaborator and she came up with a lot of, like I maybe had the idea of like, I want there to be sounds, but like she really built the language that was almost musical because she is a musician where all these diegetic sounds kind of become music. Um, and I think collaboratively, we really did what we were trying to do, which is make people feel awkward and um, really feel the pain of the character. Yeah, especially in a theater. You really, when you're going from maybe other shorts that are a bit more musical, and then mm. it's so quiet, you're, it's quite jarring in, in a great way, but <laughs> it's quite mm. And then you talk about kind of the musicality of the sounds, like how many, or I guess, what was the time period that you both spent on the sound edit itself? Because it, it's so intense in mm. there. Hmm, um, <laughs> I don't actually really remember, but I That's know okay. I know it was a long time because the yes. whole film took a long time and um, we were working on other things at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but it was actually the last film that I worked on with people in person. So um, I actually really cherish the collab that we had because we sat in a room together and mm -hmm. like worked on it. Um, you know, even though it was just like, wasn't like in a fancy studio, it was just <laughs> laptop in my basement. <laughs> um, but it was really nice to kind of sit there and like try out different things. And especially with sound design, oh my goodness, the amount of times I've tried to communicate a sound that I'm hearing that's in the mix and I don't know how to describe it over email is, comical but um yeah it, I mean it definitely took a while I want to say at least a few months of just slow back and forth and like building and we also did test screenings so there was one I think we did send out links to people that one had music and one didn't and we got people's feedback and in the end some people like the music but I just you know I followed my heart and I was like I don't think the music fits um but yeah, it was definitely a while to get to where it was. And I do prefer to make things kind of slowly over time. So it's still a collaboration that I look back on and I'm like, that was the right way to do it. Yeah, it really builds up over your whole film. It's really wonderful. The other question I had more production related as well as your production design throughout the film again, it's like obviously so planned and intentional. And I guess my question was when in your process did you start um, making those decisions for your production design? 
Great questions. Um, <laughs> thanks for noticing. Um, it is very planned um, and the colors are very distinct. So from, you know, definitely I used to do production design. So when I am creating the concept of what is happening, it is in the script sometimes. Like, you know, in the bathroom scene, I definitely wrote there were jars of coconut oil and oils on the counter. And I probably in the script for the classroom wrote, I remember that I wrote, there will be the charter of freedoms in the background, like the Canadian charter and like a Canadian flag in the background. And we have, we didn't exactly have a Canadian flag. We had some little Canada elements in it. And you had all the leaders, right? The great leaders. Yes. Right. Yeah. I don't think I put that in the script. I came up with that later, but I'll definitely think of, Again, the whole point of the film was really to, one, make pe people feel uncomfortable, but also to, like, really situate it in Canada to be, like, Canada's not perfect. There's racism here. This is what we're experiencing. So I, I knew the film would play everywhere, but I wanted it to still be Canadian. And, you know, I think Canadians just often give ourselves a pass for not being the States, and then nothing ever yeah. gets acknowledged or, or solved. So... Yeah, I wanted to make the environment seem threatening in the color choices, like all of the safe spaces in the film are like yellow and, and like a mint green. And then all of the threatening spaces are red and all the threatening characters are wearing red. So, you know, I didn't write in the script, people will be wearing red, but in the treatment process where I was developing the visuals, I was very distinct about the colors. Yeah. So I think it all... I just like as a filmmaker to use all of the tools and it is pretty early for me with production design. And, you know, I can't always say that about costumes, for example, or something like that, even if I have some ideas, cause like, I don't know that much about clothes, but <laughs> when, it comes I to, relate. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to color, yeah. I'll definitely be like, why are we choosing red over blue and what does it mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's where that. Okay. Yeah, well, great, great cues. Um, okay. <laughs> speaking of style, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about sure. your cinematography, because I feel yeah. like the film has such a strong visual language. And I know with documentary, obviously, you are filming scenes, and then sometimes you're capturing things that you don't know are going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but what really stood out to me about the film was that the cinematography seemed like so crafted in a way that it, it didn't feel like, you know, when you watch reality TV and you're like, they just went out and captured it, you know, <laughs> it feels like shots that were very beautifully and carefully composed, even though you were capturing obviously real things that were happening. So oh, I guess my thanks. question would be, did you have, was this your first collaboration with the cinematographer? And did mm -hmm. you have some, you know, certain conversations or collaboration ahead of time that, you know, was a plan of how you were going to shoot it or was it a lot of it taking place like on the day where you were like instinctually um I guess mm -hmm. guiding what was happening like what exactly was your collab with your DP because I'm sure yeah. when you're like capturing these things that are happening you know maybe you're not like okay you know yelling things out while yeah. you know <laughs> people are talking and like all those kinds yeah. of things so yeah, yeah. Yeah, so our DP was um, Alexander Desjardins. He's from Montreal. Um, we brought him over. He and I went to university together, actually. So we, I had worked with him kind of, and seen his work on other projects for a while, and I thought, okay, he might be a great fit. And then generously, um, Cineground, which is a rental house in Montreal, kind of fulfilled their greatest wish, which was to use just kind of old fixed vintage lenses. And mm -hmm. the decision on that was kind of two part. One was that Theola and Stephanie were talking about, you know, we're going into kind of sacred spaces. So how do we make sure that we're not uh, making people feel really imposed on and really, really in their face? And then the other thing that we just liked about the vintage lenses was also that we wouldn't totally know what was going to happen. And we felt like that was what was happening with the film too. Uh, we didn't really know where the end was going to be. And we hoped it would be positive, of course, but it, you know, with documentary and things move on and they were, they were a great lens choice. I think we had um, four of them in the end, which was amazing. And they had their great little own distinct features. Um, and with Theo directing, but also being in the piece, we kind of discussed before 
what our goals were, what types of shots we'd like. And then Alex and I worked pretty closely to make sure that her vision was coming forward, which was also really fun and, you know, set up and then show her and can continue as we go. But those lenses particularly were great because we were in uh, smaller spaces that were darker. They let in a lot of light. So that's why kind of we went with fixed. And then we could also... Uh, hopefully, you know, have a distinct look, which is really nice that you said come through. And then with our color mix, you went in and kind of extra worked on that. And Alex, he's wonderful. And um, I think paid a lot of attention to with the choices as to the people and the spaces we were going to be with and how to make everyone themselves feel comfortable. And even just working with him, he spent a lot of time at first just coming in. And as we all did, just kind of talking with everyone, particularly working in like hospital settings and things like that, making sure that everyone's comfort safety was first <laughs> filmmaking was especially in hospital settings is like second and we were like a privilege to be there but it was always like just a privilege at that and we were never even sure if shooting uh the baby's birth would happen or not because it's such kind of a precious thing so that room I think was maybe about the same size of the room I'm in which is not very big <laughs> quite small um and so we also didn't have space so when Alex was shooting the scene of Stephanie giving birth in her c-section the rule was that his back had to kind of be against the wall and that was the only room we had and so he had the room was like this he had over here um and that was it and it was very much if anyone taps him he's out you know any uncomfortability he leaves and he was really great about that but even so was, just he that the, space, was he the only um, one from the team in the room for the birth, he was. We, mm. we, uh, the nurses were hilarious. They were awesome. So for audio, they brought out, out IV poles and we <laughs> mic'd all the IV poles that they put in, which was really cool. And then Theo and Steph were like so brave. And so I, Theo had a mic on. I can't clearly remember if Steph did or not. She was very open to it, which is incredible. She's so strong. <laughs> um, but Alex was the only one in. And then Anthony, who was recording sound, he and I were outside with our faces like pressed against the wall, crying. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. but we were in full hazmat suits. So there's, um, there was a tour going around the hospital of new fall, like new parents and particularly they're looking down the hallway, like, what are these people doing? <laughs> but it was a great experience. So just to circle back, like for the lenses, it really was environmental, but the environmental part came out second to, to the fact that I have an obsession with old glass that I can never afford otherwise. <laughs> so it was mm -hmm. nice to get to use and sit around. Uh, helped us with that, which was really nice. Wow. And I mean, I've also shot in hospitals and like, it really yeah. does feel like you're like, there's so much happening around you and you're like mm -hmm. the least important people. Like it's a very humbling experience. Um, so how did you work to get all this access? Like it's one thing, yeah. I definitely have more questions about like the subject and the relationship and the trust that was built there, but all the like logistics of being in such mm -hmm. obviously busy, important spaces, like what was the process in yeah. actually making that happen? Theo and Steph had a really great relationship with their doctor, which was really nice. Mm. And their doctor had been aware that they had been recording audio in sessions and things like that. But when it came to originally, and I talked about in the film bit, is like Stephanie wanted to have a more traditional Indigenous birth, which was going to be something that we filmed. But due to medical complications, we moved over to C-section. So I approached um, Sunny Brook, their media coordinator, was really lovely. And I grew up pretty sick. <laughs> so I spent many months of my life in hospitals. So I think um, maybe a bit of that as well, just kind of knowing a little bit myself how the system works. And we were always very clear to them that, you know, I basically approached the media person with our documents, our pitch book, um, Stephanie and Theola had a great relationship with their doctor, which I'm sure was way more powerful, <laughs> who said yes. Um, and then we spoke to all the nursing teams, um, you know, made sure every single person was comfortable. And then also to the hospital, like, you know, at any point, just tell us, you know, and we gave them all kind of a hand signal and filming, you know, tap us, whatever, we're gone. Our whole team's, uh, well, it was small, there was four of us, <laughs> three of us, I think, but it was uh, the moment like anyone feels any type of feeling that you shouldn't be there, like leave instantly. And up to the day of, we didn't know if we were gonna film in there or not. We thought so, but we also weren't sure. So mm. that was just, it was something that was kind of nice about the process in a way too, is that it, it was really nice that we got in and it was such a treat and the staff was so trusting and so caring. But I think the team we built were also very like sensitive, aware, nice people. Like no one um, is particularly, um, loud or like 
taking up too much extra space. They were all like very, very aware and also very aware of where the gear was at all time. We took basically no gear, built it all out um, originally in the cars and mm -hmm. then tried to downsize our footprint because the last thing we wanted to do was to be in a space for other people with like, you know, five boxes and Sunnybrook was very kind and they, they gave us a room, which we didn't expect at all. We thought we'd be sitting on the curb outside. So that was really, really nice of them. But yeah, our, our main thing was that we expected to sit outside, you know, rain or shine. And then if they said yes, we would go. And if not, that would be okay too. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And so <laughs> we, I, was, I was just as surprised as, as anyone that they were, they were like, sure, come on in. And so that was really, really nice. Mm. And because obviously, like, I can see at the beginning of the movie, um, the woman is quite pregnant. But was this a long process of, like, when you started the film to the actual birth? Yeah. So it, the film was funded through the National Screen Institute. They have it in DigiDocs program. So that began fairly early on in Stephanie's pregnancy. Theo and Steph mm -hmm. had already begun taking home footage, which was really cool. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. And so they had started filming and Theo has like so many notes and she's so great at like getting the really, really important moments. Uh, the NSI DigiDocs program was in Winnipeg. It's a two week program if anyone ever wants to apply. It's amazing. Um, they gave us $15,000 for the film and they flew us out to Winnipeg for two weeks for training and then provided in-kind services for editing and sound, which was so nice um, and some legal, which was great. And so that was in February, 2019. And then the baby was born I think six, five or six months later. So they had kind of begun documenting earlier. And then as time went on, we shot, I believe, two times, two interviews before the baby was born. And then we shot the actual birth. And our original plan was to go back and shoot additional footage after, but due to just medical, we decided, you know what, that's not the best idea. And actually before COVID hit, and <laughs> it was just kind of a downside of COVID, we were gonna do a feature and follow them for an entire year up into um, the naming ceremony that would take place a year later at Theola's home territory. So that didn't happen, but it was, yeah, it, it was, I believe a few months, yeah, five or six months after, I believe. Oh, wow. So at what point did you become involved in this whole yeah, process? Pretty much from the beginning. They had some footage at home, but I was with them at the NSI and DigiDogs and then all the way okay. through. Yeah. So it was a great program that really kind of paired people together we came as a team but uh, it gave us that ability to work as a team and have act some actual money to work with which was the first <laughs> mm. yeah because it seems like uh with what we're watching like it feels very intimate and it feels like obviously there would have had to have been a lot of trust that was built between yeah. the dp and you know you and the other whoever the fourth member was yeah it was uh, <laughs> tony the yeah he was sound yeah. tony was great because he would um he was wonderful at wiring the rooms and leaving, mm. which was so, and he's also just a very kind, like nice, genuine person. So it would be okay if he was there too, but he really just made sure everyone was comfortable. Um, and then we tried to just eliminate as many people as possible when we could, but also I think Theo and Steph just really believe in the story that they're doing and, and their mission. And so does anything else matter? Oh, you know, other than that, I don't think so. And they're so brave to do this because I can't imagine what it would be like giving birth to a child with <laughs> five people watching you. That's, a, <laughs> that's not something everyone can do. So, <laughs> mm. Well, I felt like it was like very tastefully like shot where you could feel like it's interesting you describing it, um, how he was like up against the wall because it, he felt yeah. so close to everything still. So like whatever the lens choice was, like <laughs> it just, but it, but it felt still like respectful. Like it didn't yeah. feel like it felt like we all got like this wonderful privilege to be a part of the, this moment in their life. But I also like that it was like the most of the film was this lovely story of all the interconnecting bloodlines. And I love the part where um, they're talking about um the donor is the cock the other one is like the other I don't remember all the chicken the, terms that were used it was, we, we had they had they're both really really funny and they yeah, had said some other thing part. Oh, <laughs> some of the stuff we have is so funny and our editor Alicia he's so wonderful he's such a talented filmmaker in his own right producer uh incredible person I believe he just started at CBC now as a senior producer and unscripted 
amazing and he edited the film and he was sending us some very hysterical clips like all the time he was just sending us things where he's like did you guys know you recorded this but it was really uh yeah like in digidocs is what was the platform for all of us and so for anyone who's looking for funding they have other programs as well i believe they're taking applications for a producer's program we may have just closed but they're ongoing rolling um really really wonderful program you don't have to have a ton of experience it's more if you, if you have a really good story and are really passionate and i believe their website is let me just see quickly i think it's nsi um and you don't have to be from manitoba yeah it's nsi-canada.ca let me see if i can take that somewhere i don't think i can that's okay but yeah they're they're really great um and they're also um very basically they had collected funding for us from multiple different pools. So they had a $15,000 um, fund, but they had already reached out to like DGC gave us some money, which was so kind and national film board had some services and some additional donate, like all those types of things they pooled together, which was really, really nice. Cause that would have been, <laughs> you did it. It's a lot of legwork to, to gather all the funding sources. You have way more experience in that than I do. <laughs> But yeah, so they kind of took that like work for us. So for for first kind of out of school project, we were, I was very fortunate to, mm. to have that privilege. Oh, cool! This was also my first out of school project. Oh, so. that's <laughs> awesome! Yeah, I feel um, like we we're probably born in the same year. I think that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, well, and look at how successful we became. Look that's at that. <laughs> um. <laughs> how did how did your funding go? Because your funding is so. Mm -hmm. you guys raised so much money, which is wonderful. But it, it's from so many sources. And mm -hmm. how did you plan? that type of campaign and like momentum. It's really amazing. Um, I think the main thing is that we just gave ourselves time to do it because mm -hmm. uh, one of my main pieces of advice for emerging artists is just to apply for literally everything you're eligible for. So the first grant that I received was like a little community arts grant for $1,500. That was not a filmmaking grant, but I just did so much research on any money that was out there. And it was from this uh, community arts organization called Ch Children's Peace Theater, where they were just giving like, you know, micro grants to anyone, <laughs> not anyone, but, you know, marginalized artists. And so that was the first grant that I got. And at the time I was just out of school and I was like, oh, I'm just going to make the film for 5k. Like that'll be fine. And then as I kept researching more grants and something else would come out and it'd be in like a further away deadline. So I'd be like, oh, well, we got to apply for that. So we ended up applying for um, and getting um, Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council. Um, the National Film Board has a $5,000 grant that goes directly towards equipment. And I think the main piece of all of this was we just did a lot of research, not only into grants, but what who would actually fund us based on like what the film was about. And I had seen, you know, the types of projects that were funded by some of these arts councils. So I felt confident that we could get those grants. And the last major piece of the puzzle was that we um, did a huge Kickstarter campaign. And again, it's not like we just went out there and we're like, we're just going to do this. We had a lot of planning and we knew that we were making something that people would get behind. Um, there's plenty of films about hair now, which is amazing. Um, but at the time I was really going around saying like, I'm making this film because I haven't seen it. And uh, it felt like we were also with the Kickstarter campaign, um, almost like doing this huge educational, like, public service announcement about black hair for everybody. Um, and I think one of the main bits of our campaign was we just promoted it so much. We reached out to so many news organizations and like anything from the Toronto star to like individual black bloggers that could just talk about it. So I don't know. I think we very much took this, like, don't wait for people to find you or to talk about you, like go out and tell everybody what you're doing. And I had two other producers, Rebecca Ortiz and Vanessa Harris, who were equally as dedicated in literally writing these million grant applications, emailing 500, you know, news people several times just to get, you know, the word out there. So we just kept raising money because we knew we wanted to pay the team and to like get as much as we could. And we just did everything 
you know, I even just had a birthday party and was like, if everyone just comes to my birthday, don't buy me a drink and just donate to my film. <laughs> and then we made 500 bucks. That's so like awesome. <laughs> literally anything we could think of, we did. And, and you, you know, have a lot of friends. So that's, like <laughs> you know, that's I guess. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. So just throw everything at the wall, apply for everything and make it with what you have. You don't have to raise 50 K, but at the same time, if you want to, it is possible. And it's, it's nice to be able to what you're saying, actually pay people mm -hmm. and, and to get paid yourself is really important. And I think sometimes um, traditionally, like female filmmakers have obviously have not been paid as much as male filmmakers and have maybe been expected to take that cut um, and see it more as an opportunity, which is mm -hmm. not uh, quite fullable. But yeah, so it, it's so great to see that you guys really got out there and, and raised everything. And it's something that I... I'm still learning. <laughs> so it's good to hear. What? How did you organize when you're applying to so many different programs? Like, What was your organizational strategy to make sure that you were hitting your deadlines and not getting overwhelmed? Um, I, I mean, I, I still have a document with like every like spring, fall, summer, mm -hmm. winter, like every like not even just grants, mentorship programs that are out there. So um, I mean, listen, there was one... <laughs> Thing that we applied for that we missed the deadline by one minute and it was devastating <laughs> and it was Ontario Arts Council and it was for oh, 10 grand and it oh. was the biggest thing we were applying for so were we super organized <laughs> yes and no um and what we ended up doing because we're like man we worked so hard on this application yeah. and we missed it by one minute let's just wait for the next deadline so a lot of it was yes we were organized and we were doing our best but you know there was three of us working so hard also working our jobs so, you know, a part of it was like, just waiting, like, we were like, man, the next deadline is six months away, guess we're just gonna wait for it. So um, I think that's also something to keep in mind, like, you can always retry, like, you can always one up mm -hmm. yourself. I think a lot of people get discouraged um, when they don't get in some of the programs I've been in, I've applied twice, and then I've made it. So, you know, I think getting feedback not even just from grant people, but from anyone and understanding like maybe what it is they're looking for better and then re having another go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had a document with all these grants and then some of them, <laughs> you know, we didn't make That's okay. something we didn't get. And yeah. then the ones that we did, you know, I'm just a strong believer in like, if you are meant to have it, it will happen. And, you know, many things we didn't get. And I was like, but yeah. <laughs> No, it's all good. <laughs> Secretly behind your computer, like, oh, that took a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and then I guess the other question I had was like, for your work going forward, are you looking at doing the same type of funding strategies? And then secondary question that's somewhat unrelated, but for distribution, kind of like doing your first film out of school, um, how did you learn about that? And what was your distribution plan for your first film? Um, well, definitely, I have funded another film basically through arts councils. Um, and I'm not trying to fund my films in the same way. I definitely don't want to do another Kickstarter campaign. It mm -hmm. is a full time job. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one reason why some people's campaigns don't succeed is because we were like social media posting like three times a day, like, you know, it was a lot of work. Um, so I don't want to do another one of those. But um, now that I have work and a reel and I've been funded before, it is much easier to know how to write a good arts grant application. So that is one way that I really look forward to continuing to fund my work because I love the freedom that they give you and they really do just want to support you as an artist. And then I think other things people could consider is you can always collaborate with broadcasters like CBC has their short doc um, thing. Anyone can pitch to them. Um, there's many places where you can, well, there's not many, but you know, there's arts councils, there's CBC, there's programs like what you described where you can make something in it. And I think everybody should consider those routes. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many much, much shorter projects I will do, but I've done also commissions um, for like the last one I did was for Real Canada and Netflix for National Film Day. So I'm always still trying to apply for things where the funding is already done and I'm just taking the money and making it. I'm not, I'm, I think I've paid my dues in terms of like grassroots putting all this money together um, mm -hmm. and also 
as a director, I am kind of hoping to maybe work with more experienced producers that can do that uh, with me being a little bit less involved because in your early work, you know, it's really the whole team coming together to really figure out how to do that. Um, and then the distribution, honestly, it was really trial and error. We applied to a million festivals. We threw a lot of money into that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of rejection that we received. We definitely didn't play the main things that we thought would like make our careers and wanted to play. But at the same time, I've now kind of released this attachment to festival success. And I've really, I really do believe whoever is meant to see and love your film, um, mm -hmm. they'll find it. And, you know, this film has taken on a life of its own with just the festivals that have programmed it and the people that have seen it wherever they've seen it and the people that, you know, donated to Kickstarter and like read about us wherever. And I'm really appreciative of the journey that we had. So, I mean, I, we ended up getting a, distrib a distributor, but that was only after we won a Canadian Screen Award and we actually reached out to them before. Um, and they were like, oh, we're not interested. <laughs> and then we won the award and I was like, well, well, well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they're, they're not distributing us for film festivals, but they do sales for us, which is cool because you know, we were really tapped out in terms of wanting to do more with the film after working on it for two years and doing all this mm -hmm. festival stuff. So it was kind of cool that they came two years later, yeah. being like injecting this new life into it. And they've sold it in Canada and Europe. And, you know, they have the know how into doing that. And amazing. Ba yeah, basically, we just reached out to them. And then, you know, it's their job to know, I guess, who's winning these awards because they just distribute shorts so they reached back out to us <laughs> afterwards so again sometimes awesome. people aren't there on the first go but you know they change their minds you go back um, to their email like Ooh. <laughs> this yeah. is yeah that's awesome we worked with uh the winnipeg film group which is anyone's looking for cool. distribution and yeah they're more of a co-op um and how and early on did they help you with festivals or did they like when um, did they come on board they were on board i would that's a good question Theo and I did the uh, main festivals we were looking at ourselves. So we did the hot doc submissions and we had done a few others, but then they came on and what they were really great for was like every other festival, <laughs> you know, they, they had such a great reach within the Canadian community and were so supportive and had so many ideas that we wouldn't have thought of. And something that I didn't realize going in kind of with the first film to distribute was um, how useful it is having a distributor really handle the paperwork and the file sending and the organization. It was, you know, in a sense, a huge relief to have someone else be willing to do that. Um, and I would definitely recommend them to anyone who's looking at distributing a film. And it was really great for, um, for Hot Docs, which has been such a supportive, incredible festival for us. I, <laughs> I probably mildly embarrassed myself because we submitted and then down the line, someone had said, oh, well, you know, you should send an email to the programmers to, you know, mm. which I had, hadn't occurred to me. And I, I sent the email the day before the list came out. So that was <laughs> the time. Oh, was what did you say in the email? Was it like, were well, you just I, like flagging the film I, or? I had met a programmer before at Hot Dogs and had described the project and said, you know, we're through NSI. And uh, they had said, oh, well, let us know, which was very kind of them, but being somewhat nervous well nervous most of the time I was like oh I don't know I don't know so I debated on it for like four months and then sent it but of course by the time I sent it it was long past their <laughs> decision making but I, I think there was a lesson that like I would probably do that earlier in the process if I had had a conversation with someone before um, and they've been very very supportive and, and very amazing we didn't expect we didn't think we were um, going to get in anyway <laughs> at first and then we, we were so thankful that they they gave us such a huge platform especially with the film that you know we love the film we see such a positive message in it but there has been the um occasional person who doesn't and um we, we've been very fortunate that the film has taken on a very positive film because we we had some discussions that uh, you know when we were about to release it which was like how do we how do we handle this film ending up on um, a subset of the internet that's really toxic and you know obviously is not anything we agree with in any way but you know we we were we had a lot of discussions with Theo and Steph and especially around protecting the identity of their child to make sure that that wouldn't um, just so that everyone was we hoped it didn't happen and it didn't which was great but I had some real concerns at, at some point of it ending up on especially um 
you know, during the Trump re-election campaign when things were so horrible, and they still are, but we were, had some thoughts about just making sure everyone was safe and um, also that there, even though it's a beautiful story, does everyone feel the same? We don't care about their opinions. I don't think their opinions. I think it's just bigotry and, you know, horrible things. But yeah, it, it, we were very fortunate and very, very thankful that the film ended up um, in, in really wonderful spaces and hasn't ended up in those other spaces, which is really mm. nice. Yeah, and I mean, to be recognized by, like, basically Canada's two biggest film festivals. Like, oh, yeah. It's kind of a big deal. Thanks. Yeah, we were shocked. There was no, we both, Theo and I, we were like, because <laughs> there, there was only three of us who made it, really, or four, sorry. It was uh, Lucius, who is editor, so kind, Alex, DP, myself, and Tony did our um, on location sound, and then he also did our mix and our score. So we, we were really, really thankful for, for that and for the support from the community because we, we had no idea. <laughs> it was very much just submitting applications and, and hoping that, you know, it would even be looked at, but mm. we, were, we were lucky. Well, I think that's also kind of good to know because I, like when you submit to big film festivals, yeah. you kind of feel like, are they even watching all the <laughs> films? And I know that they are. I mean, I don't yeah. know about some Sundance, Sorry, Sundance. Are you guys watching all the films? But um, it it is kind of nice to know that you, but probably by the time that you had emailed that programmer, you were already selected. You know, yeah. so it's kind of cool to know that like your film obviously just got in on its own merit. Not saying that when you email someone and flag your film, obviously the film is still getting in on its own merit. But I know what you're saying. Though. Yeah, it's just yeah. cool that out of the millions of selections, yeah. the thousands that they watch, that it just kind of stood out. Oh, um, but I do always wonder, like, yeah, this... <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know what was the? I think what was an interesting one too was um, for us, Hamptons Film Festival in the U.S. Um, selected us in competition for their short thought program, and, and we that was truly a, like without a box admission, mm. and so we were super surprised about that one too because we had um, not even community or or um, yeah, not you know, not even the the part of like being from the area that made the film, like there was none of that. This was purely an American that we knew no one at um, in any way. So that, that was really nice, but I don't know. Yeah. Submit your stuff. Don't, don't, but don't, don't spend yeah. too much money submitting stuff. Yes. Though. And what I learned the hard <laughs> way is definitely do research. Like there was yeah. many festivals where I was like, this festival only accepts 10 shorts. Why did I, and not saying you won't be one of the 10, but if you look at some of the films that they've accepted and it's yeah. not anything like your film, you know the taste of the programmer so yeah, yeah definitely do research on where you're submitting especially if you have a tight budget because yeah. i think you know when we finished pick we were just like it's amazing it's gonna get in everywhere and it is amazing. Into a bunch <laughs> of places but we could have been a little bit more curated with what we spent our money on so yeah that's fair that's anyway. fair. <laughs> yeah i don't it's end up where it's supposed to end up but yeah yeah, exactly. And then do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, you're from like Scarborough and how that affects your filmmaking work. And then you also said you're applying even just for grants and things like that, maybe from your community. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. That Children's Peace Theater thing was actually a Scarborough organization. And I don't even know how I knew about that place. But um, yeah. So, I mean, that's something else to think about is think about how your community can uh, really give back to what you're trying to do and if there's anything already happening. Um, I mean, I, I am, it's kind of just like asking like, how does it being a black woman affect your filmmaking? Like I am from Scarborough. So much of my upbringing was influenced by being around people of different cultures um, and also being around nature. Um, so I think that I was really encouraged to be imaginative because my childhood was like going on my bike into the nearest ravine and yeah. just <laughs> being by myself and like, I don't know, making things up. Um, and I really do think that has a lot to do with deciding to become an artist because I think being an artist is just still not being afraid to um, show your inner child. And I feel like having this very adventurous childhood in the suburbs made me um, just an imaginative person. And I was like free to think and to roam around by myself. So um, that was one major bit of it. And yeah, I mean, I still obviously made the film about like 
the, the character is like the only black girl in her school. And mm -hmm. the, I actually wrote that more about being in university, um, not about being in Scarborough because my Scarborough life was very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, but I can say that my upbringing in a very diverse elementary school and all my friends were from different cultures just kind of made me uh, it was it was like a little utopia, like the utopia that everyone wants to hope Canada is. I do mm -hmm. kind of feel like Scarborough has a little bit of everybody. And I was so it's just interesting because when you're younger, you really go to people's houses a lot because that's like the thing to do. And I feel like because I grew up around so many different families and different yeah. ethnicities and different foods it's just made me the person that I am today and it's made me very I don't know culturally sensitive and empathetic and in the same way that I hope watching movies that are very culturally specific um helps people empathize with people's perspectives and stories they might not understand I feel like I got that by watching people's families mm -hmm. in their homes yeah. um anyways uh yeah so and that's was kind of all about where I came from. Why don't you talk a little bit about like how you feel like your heritage maybe influences your filmmaking? Yeah, I think I come from a family of storytellers. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's always been that's kind of what everyone does is just sits around um, and tell stories. And it's been interesting, like, I think in the last few years, um, like, my mom's side is the Indigenous side of my family. And it's been something that people become really proud of, which is really, really nice. But oh, sorry, that was my cat throwing objects in the other room. That's really nice of her. Um, but when I, when I was younger, it was, it, was, um, it was a challenge, I think, for our family. My grandfather, for what stereotypes are worth, very much looked Native um, and had a really difficult time and, and couldn't get hired anywhere because everyone said they didn't want to hire a drunk. You know, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything. And his workaround was he'd get a perm. So no one would be able, you know, try and change his appearance. Um, and he was very, very resourceful, which I think was, even though it was kind of out of a sad situation, which I didn't know until I was much earlier, it was really great to be around someone who was so resourceful and like always finding ways to, you know, work two jobs and, and still be really positive. And uh, I think my grandfather ran away as an orphan. He was like 12 or 13. So it was always still like wow. doing his own education and really like reading. And so it, it was nice. And it, you don't necessarily know always from people like why that is until you're a little bit older <laughs> which is fair and yeah, then I had learned from um his brother that he had lived with the priest who ran the residential school in their community as well so he was also like a very resourceful um man who was always trying to help people and very kind but also very stubborn <laughs> which I think has really helped with uh filmmaking too but it's, it's been an interesting time and it, it's actually really nice to see that people are now really able to be proud publicly of where they come from and um people aren't allowed to say the same comments anymore <laughs> though I'm sure people still do um but yeah it, it's been great I mean something I'd love to see happen in the Indigenous filmmaking community is have the way funding is given out distributed a bit differently and maybe have it be a bit more clearly defined between people like myself who come from like a city area and have a lot more access to resources versus people who may be coming from communities that require often a completely different set of funding and different ways of even um, funding being distributed in terms of like maybe they need to get equipment up to a location that's much further away like different pockets of money and things like that because that I think that would be something good because I, I always feel like if there's money available it should go to people who are from communities who are either working on their community or um, coming to maybe see to work on their project as well first. And then if you're, um, you know, have a bit, are able to have more resources or even just able to like go down to TIFF watch, maybe like just more things in the area. I feel like that should be maybe like a second wave um, mm. or, or some sort of discussions about that I think are happening, which is really good too. Um, and, and just to kind of like, figure figure out that out because it's yeah everyone deserves a good opportunity to celebrate you know who they are and where they're from but there's obviously a lot more challenges depending on some of the communities but you know if you're from way way up north in the country that that is obviously much more difficult to make a film and it's much more requires probably much more funding in a sense as well versus someone who's shooting in Toronto who can you know use the streetcar to go get their equipment and, and things like that Mm, but yeah. hopefully that keeps evolving I think people are working on it which is nice mm -hmm. but it's so true I feel like overall the hope 
that I have is just that just people who have like not historically had access to tell their story can and you're right that does go much deeper than just like you know writing it down there's way it's way more involved making a film and getting the resources and the courage even Mm. just to do it and unfortunately you know many people that have grown up in our society that aren't white men don't feel (laughs) like their story is of value because they didn't grow up seeing their story told and you know that's what is so awesome about real world is like Toronto filmmakers that are marginalized are playing their work and it's like there's so many barriers that you have it's like once you even get the film made is there going to be a programmer that's going to get it and actually play it And like Mm -hmm. there's so many levels of there's so many barriers that we have to get over and it's just and like can you afford to put your film on Vimeo for two years like that's really expensive yeah you know stuff like yeah that. Well, and can you afford the festival fee like yeah. there's so many <laughs> barriers um so I think that would be my main hope is that like some of these barriers get knocked down and mm-hmm. it just is a little bit easier for um people who haven't historically been celebrated and represented to tell their stories and then get them programmed at major yeah. places <laughs> exactly thank Hi. you both for a great conversation uh we're just going to jump to some audience questions right now um, and Sophie B wants to know if you could speak to the editing process um, and finding your collaborators, specifically any tips you have for people who did not go to film school. Sure. Well, um, my editor is actually my film school editor. Um, however, <laughs> I do have other collaborators who I've met in the industry. And I think my main Um, piece of advice would just be to go to film festivals especially ones that are playing shorts and look at the films that you like and then reach out to those people and it doesn't have to be a reach out like hey I'm making this film Um, can you join just something like I like the film and then connect with those people I think it's always valuable to connect with somebody before you have a project and then you might have this roster of potential collaborators and if you're looking at films that you actually like, the chances are that those people might be someone who are like-minded to you. So I think going to local film festivals, not just TIFF, like, you know, Real World, Regent Park, um, Breakthroughs, um, and those people are all emerging filmmakers too. So um, making those connections just by talking to people whose work you like. That's really smart. Um, Our editor for our film was a recommendation of a friend. But the editor, well, I'm doing a project right now that I'm editing, um, mostly because I have no money, (laughs) but also because it's it's kind of a personal project. I'm tracking down uh, a man in Montreal who shoots up women's skirts all over the city. He's done it to me. He's done it to almost all my friends. Uh, And so we decided we were going to make a film back about him uh, and find him ourselves. So that's been, um, I think... Long story short, what I'm trying to say is I think you can do a lot more yourself too than what you think. Um, and if you're struggling to find someone who fits your project well, maybe you're supposed to do it as well. And it's uh, I spend so much time watching YouTube tutorials and uh, you know downloading free extension packs and and really just trying to be able to hopefully create some work myself just because sometimes you don't get the funding <laughs> and you still want to make your project. And if you end up with, you know, a thousand or two dollars, that's still great. But it may mean that you have to uh, become your editor and camera operator and uh, VFX person yourself. But it, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not a great answer, but Oh, this is the other thing I was going to say. I also started working with um, a young person recently off of Instagram who made these like incredible TikTok videos. They were so well done. They live in the UK and I sent them a message and was like, hey, these are so cool. Like, uh, you know, do you take on the project? And they're like, yep. And so we set a rate that was fair, but it it wasn't necessarily a commercial rate, you know, but they're they're still making a a, definitely a fair rate. So I like that. I like the social media route as well, which would be kind of fun. But yeah, so I I don't know, maybe find a good TikToker. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, independent festivals as well as social media. Great spaces for, for networking. Um, Crystal Rose wants to know if you can speak on how you were able to develop your films. So in essence, um, connecting with producers um, for the process. Well, my producer was also from film school. <laughs> and um, this was my first 
major project outside of school. So a lot of the people that I was working with kind of initially signed on before we had any money. And so they were my previous collaborators and friends. And then um, I also enlisted my sister to just become a producer. So um, <laughs> that was a strategy. I, I don't know if I would recommend it, but um, she did a great job. She's like, this is my one and done. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would just kind of say the same thing that I said before, like try to find people who are doing what you want to do and like-minded people. And I would also say, don't be afraid to reach out to people who are more experienced than you. Like something I can point to at, from pick was I was one year out of film school and I reached out to somebody who was like for a DP that was 10 years in the game. And, you know, if you have a really good project, there will be people who are willing to work for a reduced rate or sometimes for free on a short that's going to be shot in three days, you know, because they're probably like we all are in the industry, um, having a balance of stuff that pays you money and then stuff that you're passionate about. So I would still just say, genuinely find who you like, uh, whose work you like, because those will be the people that you'll be able to convince <laughs> and probably inspire by what you are trying to do to enlist them to join your projects. And also just kind of recognizing that, I don't know, whoever you are meant to collaborate with, I think you will find them. So beyond even film festival, just going to film events, like going to, you know, networking things. And, you know, even though that seems like intimidating, maybe you're not going and going to meet everybody there, but you might really connect with one or two people that now you'll think of later. Um, and also social media, I will also say like, there's groups like the BIPOC film and TV group and uh, that I need a fixer producer group where you can just post what you're looking for and you will get recommendations. So that's really helpful. Yeah. And then one thing I'll add would be for hot dogs has um, every year, almost like a speed dating uh, session with your idea to different broadcasters, which is really wonderful. And they also have uh, the form, which you can apply for every year, which is like, I think it's so cool. I haven't done it. We basically go into this large room and there's like 20 to 30 broadcasters at a table and you pitch to all of them at once. Um, and so that's a program you have to apply for that people seem to have a lot of success with, even just with what Alicia is saying, like building relationships in the future um, with people. And it's funny, like my documentary mentor, I was a part of TIFF Next Wave way back in the day. <laughs> and uh, my documentary mentor is from that. Uh, so I've known him since I was 15 now, I think, which is a, quite a long time. And then uh, my writing mentor I met at Hot Docs, just at uh, kind of a meet and greet bumping around. And we just kept crossing paths. Like as much as the online festival have been incredible, I'm so excited also for real life to be able to kind of accidentally bump into people <laughs> over and, and then you start to really see the faces. So yeah, I think, I think if you're able to like, work with people that you forge genuine friendships with, or you have like real common interest in talking with producers and filmmakers that you, um, maybe you're inspired by their work, but also are in a sense, can not continuing their specific journey, but have some sort of relation to the subject that's really, really useful as well. Wonderful. And speaking of the pandemic, I'm wondering uh, what's been sort of the thing that, that's keeping you both going in terms of inspiration, as well as the future for, you know, this really exciting time um, for Indigenous and Black women filmmakers in Canada. Yeah, I was shooting a short doc that was supposed to be in person and it's no longer. <laughs> I've been shooting most of it in this room uh, and now I have to be in it. So that that's fun for me, not really. <laughs> but it, it's been a set of challenges, but I think uh, for myself during COVID, um, it forced me to kind of go back to my original roots of like shooting things myself and kind of really like high school making short films like in my room. But it's been, I'm not happy about COVID, don't get me wrong, but it, that's been a kind of a refreshing uh, process again when, when you're really just making projects that you want to make. Um, but no, COVID has been definitely, I mean, I've had periods of time where I've just have been unable to think of anything that I would, you know, remotely think is worth making. <laughs> and I, I, that's, a, I think that's a thing a lot of people experience during COVID where it's just, you have time, but you don't. And, you know, that endless circle. Amazing. Really. Yeah. And I think, uh, I mean, what's really been keeping me going is like non-film related activities. Um, I think in the beginning, 
Um, I was planning to make a short that summer and, uh, oh, you know, I had a lot of plans and I was planning to go to the CSAs. Like I was in a film festival in Miami that got canceled and then flew back and everything was happening. So it was a really humbling experience because it was kind of like everything that we got rewarded for, for our film was canceled. And that was obviously very upsetting because we made this film for two years so like we were finally celebrating it but it kind of just reminded me that like my career isn't necessarily about these like fancy events or film festivals it was really that i feel like the film kind of did its job because i actually finished it and i actually told a very personal vulnerable story and even though we didn't have these like you know fancy celebrations that we were supposed to attend many people Instagram messaged me or came up to me when we did have some in-person screenings and said like this one, either it was like black women or black people saying this film really resonated with me and was really personal, or it was non-black people saying, wow, I really learned something from this film. And I kind of realized that will always, that is the most important thing that happens. And that's possible even if things are canceled. So I think it can be easy to get caught up into what festival am I playing or like what dress am I wearing <laughs> to this thing? Um, and I'm really kind of grateful that I just kind of was reminded like, okay, these things could be happening or not, but what will always be the thing that's happening is I've made the film and people will watch it and enjoy it. And that is really, I think the main part point of my career. So that wasn't really an answer to the question, but <laughs> it's a good, no, it's a good way to look at it though. Cause we had the similar experience where things were, where everything was canceled. Um, I haven't seen the film in a theater yet with an audience other than like friends, uh, but that's okay. And, and especially um, hot dogs, they did such a great job with the online stuff and they, they were so caring and wonderful, but yeah, I, I you know I think you did answer it <laughs> really well. There's lots to look forward to for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I just want to thank RBC again for presenting this event. And also Alicia and Alex, thank you very much for your insightful conversation and answers to the questions. Thank you all for joining us today and uh, we'll see you at the next event. Thanks. Bye everyone.